It's Christmas. As children tumble out of bed and flock to the tree, parents groggily make a cup of coffee to watch the main event, the annual unwrapping of presents. A dopamine-filled experience for little kids hoping for that new toy, pair of pants, or for this kid, a... As someone who grew up celebrating Christmas, I can relate to that feeling. When I was younger, the surprise and satisfaction of receiving the action figure you always wanted was electric. But as I grow older, the phenomenon of Christmas has taken on a different hue. Christmas, especially in the US, has transformed into something more than a Christian holiday celebrating the birth of Jesus. It's become the epitome of capitalism itself. With rampant waste, emissions, and labor abuses, the season of Christmas has been co-opted wholesale by capital. But Christmas wasn't always like this. It was actually kind of the opposite. Today we dive into that history in order to understand how this turned into this, why we consume so much on Christmas, and how past holiday revelries might offer up a path towards a more environmentally just celebration of Christmas. Today we discover how capitalism stole Christmas and how we can steal it back. This video is made possible by Curiosity Stream and Nebula. By subscribing to Nebula with the link in the description, you not only directly support our changing climate, but you also get access to my next video on overpopulation a month early, as well as over 20 bonus videos and extended editions that aren't on YouTube. You can watch them all on Nebula by signing up for the Curiosity Stream Nebula bundle at curiositystream.com/occ or using the link in the description below. A day after the U.S. celebrates their settler colonial origins, the world gets doused with deals on Black Friday. And with those deals come a rush of crowds and, more recently, a mountain of boxes. Spurred on by the companies drumming up hype for the Christmas season through advertising, movies, and music, we are drawn to retail stores and online shops ready to buy that brand new gadget for a friend or family that they probably won't use. This season, which generally starts at the end of November and ends at the start of the new year, is primarily characterized by a month of shopping. Shopping for presents that a bearded white man in a red suit will then sneak under a tree in houses all across the world. Shopping that fuels more than a third of toy retailers' yearly profit in just three months. We spend so much on presents that a 2016 survey found that 22% of respondents from the US claimed that they went into debt paying for presents and festivities. And it's all in service of the big day. A day spent with your nuclear family, watching the kids open presents and then lounging around the rest of the day in your single family home enjoying your new toys. After it's all done, the trees head to the dump, the wrapping paper gets thrown in the trash, and the dopamine rush wears off, it's back to business as usual, but this time with a little more stuff to stuff in your closet. But Christmas is not some amorphous holiday with no roots. It's intimately tied to Christianity. For those of the Christian faith, this holiday means celebrating the birth of their Messiah. Although, for as much as Christmas is technically a Christian holiday, the religiosity of it seems to have been wiped clean from advertisements, movies, and revelry. Indeed, a Pew Research study found that 9 out of 10 Americans observe Christmas in some way, regardless of whether they identify as Christian. Whether it's an active celebration of the holiday, or feeling pushed to observe it because your Christian society pressures you to, Christmas has become a massive force in our global economy. One that seems to have eschewed some of its Christian imagery and embraced the symbols and ideology of capitalism. The Christmas of today, with its emphasis on cozy material consumption inside a single family home, epitomizes the dreams of the capitalist class. Christmas silos the biological family and coerces us to buy goods to show our love. Goods that usually end up wasted or unused and drive capitalist accumulation. But Christmas in the US wasn't always like this. In fact, it was almost the opposite. It's 1820 and the snows of December are settling onto the streets of New York City. While some cozy up to the fire and spend time indoors to celebrate Christmas and the new year, many are out on the streets 
making noise. In the early 19th century, the week between Christmas and New Year's was marked by public revelry and misrule. The workers and laborers of New York City spent the week reversing the norms of their city. They took their partying out onto the streets, played loud music in what are called Calathumpian parades, and generally made a ruckus. As industrial capitalism expanded its factories, improved its machinery, and exploited increasingly more laborers on the wage market, the 1820s witnessed the growth of the urban proletariat. So that week of public revelry in the 1820s wasn't just a time of pleasure and release for those toiling away under their capitalist bosses. It was also a time to reverse their power, if only for a moment. When these roving Calathumpian parades hit the streets, they did so in the neighborhoods of the rich and powerful. In Stephen Nissenbaum's book, The Battle for Christmas, he recounts one such scene in 1826, when a gang stopped in front of the Broadway house of the city's mayor. There enacted a scene of disgraceful rage. So during the Christmas season, the newly minted urban wage laborers were using the traditions of public revelry as a weapon to brandish their discontent and achieve some means of agency. Nissenbaum notes that December for the growing population of industrial wage laborers meant uncertainty. It could mean increased hours at work to keep up with business as usual, or for others, forced unemployment because winter freezes ground water-powered factories to a halt. This means the Christmas season was marked by an acute feeling of working class discontent about their conditions. So as Nissenbaum goes on to write, the Christmas season with its carnival traditions of wassail, misrule, and Calathumpian street theater could easily become a vehicle of social protest, an instrument to express powerful ethnic and class resentments. Throughout the early 19th century, the traditions of public revelry were wielded on the streets of urban centers like New York City as a means of protest. Christmas represented an opportunity for social inversion, where as journalist Paul Ringel writes, poorer people could demand food and drink from the wealthy and celebrate in the streets, abandoning established social constraints. But the capitalist class, the wealthy elite who were made to feel unsafe in their homes during the Christmas season, didn't sit idly by while these gangs of revelers upended their social structure. They had a plan. They sought to change the traditions of Christmas itself. John Pintard was a propertied man, a man of fine tastes, who felt threatened by the presence of poor and houseless people on the streets of New York that he started the Society for the Prevention of Pauperism in 1817. His goal was to rid the city of public begging and drinking in order to make the streets of the growing city safe for wealthy property owners like himself. He inevitably failed. But that wasn't his only quest. Throughout the beginning of the 1800s, John Pintard, who established the New York Historical Society and is partly responsible for popularizing July 4th and Columbus Day as holidays, wanted to civilize Christmas. Pintard developed a buckshot of different traditions surrounding Christmas and New Year's in reaction to the public revelry of the working class. He introduced St. Nicholas to the U.S., held indoor banquets for his friends at City Hall to celebrate that saint on December 6th, and invited extended family into his home for parties on New Year's. By 1830, though, Pintard finally set his sights on Christmas Day, December 25th a day he sought to encourage family-oriented private gatherings. Specifically, he wanted to build holiday traditions that replaced the public revelry now deemed out of fashion and distasteful by the capitalist class with one focused on gift-giving to children. As Nissenbaum writes in The Battle for Christmas, the children of a single household had replaced a larger group of the poor and powerless as the symbolic objects of charity and benevolence. Pintard was not alone in this quest to transform the holiday, however. He was a part of a group of wealthy urbanites who called themselves the Knickerbockers. The group included short story author Washington Irving and poet Clement Moore, who both used their skills with a pen to draft new myths of Christmas, like Moore's The Night Before Christmas, a now famous poem that wove together various traditions to shape Christmas as a quiet, cozy, child-centric day of presence and a magical visit from St. Nicholas. The Knickerbockers did not single-handedly transform the holiday, but they were instrumental in developing the traditions behind them. They produced new ways of celebrating Christmas that appealed to those scared of the rapidly urbanizing and industrializing public spaces of the 19th century. 
As journalist Paul Ringel writes in The Atlantic, middle-class parents latched onto the traditions that Pintard and the Knickerbockers drummed up because they encouraged young Americans to associate the joys of the holiday with the morally and physically protective space of the home. In short, the introduction of St. Nicholas and the spirit of family and kid-oriented gift-giving in the home was a reaction to the proletarian public revelry and holiday unrest in the beginning of the 19th century. The elite transformed Christmas to feel safe from the workers they exploited. But how did we go from kids receiving sugar plums by firelight to this? Oh my God. For that, we need to turn to Santa Claus. Christmas is all about this guy. No, not the Jewish revolutionary zealot from Nazareth who sought to overthrow the rich elite of Jerusalem and Rome. Today's capitalist Christmas centers around this guy. A white, old, bearded man stealing down your chimney to give you gifts and eat your cookies. Santa Claus has been around for a long time. Since the early 1800s, Washington Irving and Clement Moore began to shape St. Nicholas into a thick-bellied Dutch sailor with a pipe. But it wasn't until a century later that the Santa Claus we know today and the copious amount of presents he brings became a fully-fledged image. The image of the jolly, rosy-cheeked man all decked out in red was finalized by the artist Haddon Sunbloom and wielded as a tool by a famous corporation. Starting in the 1930s, Coca-Cola employed Sunbloom and used his rich depictions of a merry white-haired Santa Claus to sell their product. The advertising campaign worked so well that from 1931 to 1964, Coca-Cola had Sunbloom paint Santa Claus into their brand every Christmas season. Each advertisement saw jolly old Santa Claus sipping a Coke or raiding a home's fridge for a stash of their product. While Coca-Cola by no means invented Santa Claus, they wielded his imagery to sell their product, and in the process helped shape Santa and ultimately the purpose of the holiday itself. It became a holiday of buying stuff. This co-option of Christmas as a holiday of material goods grew in conjunction with Pintard and his associates' crusade to privatize festivities. In the 1820s, the emerging child toy industry realized that Christmas was a lucrative opportunity to sell their products. The tradition of gift-giving to children meshed well with the rapidly growing toy industry. And by the turn of the 20th century, toy makers were filling newspapers and magazines with advertisements hailing children to buy their toys during Christmas time. And soon, other industries latched on to the Christmas season. It became a time to offload their production onto the masses for profit. Retailers from Sears Roebuck to Macy's to JCPenney decked out their magazines and stores with Christmas trappings aligning themselves with the holiday and in the process using it as a way to boost their revenue. This commercialization of Christmas has led to the crushing reality of shame and guilt felt during the Christmas season. As George Monbiot writes in The Guardian, the endless Christmas marketing and mythos around gift giving induces the desire to buy more if you can and shame if you can't. Christmas's transformation from public revelry towards private gift giving and then the subsequent commercialization of those gifts has meant that our love is measured by the quality and quantity of presents we give. And the toll of this capitalist takeover of Christmas is immense, both on us and the environment. 17 deaths and 125 injuries. That's the toll Black Friday shopping in the US has taken since 2006. Desperate for the cheapest goods because we're exploited in the workplace and receive meager wages for our labor, we flock to stores and trample over each other in search of that new TV. Advertisements and once a year deals drive us to consume at record amounts. The average American spent $1,447 over the holidays in 2021 and is expected to spend a similar amount this year. And all of that spending is buying hundreds of thousands of miles of wrapping paper, sending billions of pounds of return presents to the landfill, and in the process, we emit 650 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent per person in just three days of Christmas festivities. If you celebrate Christmas, you've witnessed the waste it creates. Whether it's the wrapping paper tossed to the side, or that book your grandma gave you that's collecting dust in the back of your closet, or those pants that you never returned and then threw out. 
This waste has material consequences. Trees are cut down, coal is burned, and workers toil in dehumanizing conditions to bring that wrapping paper and the presence within them to our homes. Only for us to throw both away after the dopamine rush wears off. All the while, corporations profit and accumulate more wealth. It's tempting to pin the waste, pollution, and excess of Christmas on rampant consumerism. Supposedly, people just don't know when to stop buying and don't value the stuff they own. But it's more than that. As we saw earlier, companies have a vested interest in us buying as much of their product as possible. If they're not constantly producing more goods and selling them at cheaper prices, other companies will just outcompete them. So retailers smother us in Christmas-themed advertising starting as early as mid-October, create strategic sale days, and do everything in their power to convince us to buy their products. For those of us who don't want to partake, who seek to stop the material waste of Christmas, our lack of buying changes very little. The damage is already done. Production has already happened and retailer goods are already stockpiled high in warehouses. This year, for example, companies like Nike and Dell have already created the goods they plan to sell during the holiday season, some $732 million of it. Their stockpiles aren't a response to high consumer demand. In fact, they're just the opposite. Consumer spending is down this year because of factors like high inflation rates and an unstable economy. And yet companies produced warehouses and warehouses full of products. In short, regardless of whether customers are buying, companies are still producing. And in the process, they create junk, waste, pollution, and exploit their workers to produce even more. Christmas is not a holiday of consumerism. It's a holiday of capitalist production. One where parts of the retail industry make a third of their yearly sales in three months. So to lessen the toll of Christmas, we must do more than just buy less or wrap presents in cloth. We must envision a holiday that embraces an anti-capitalist and ethical politics. We need a war on capitalist Christmas. Imagine a holiday that's not based around the church, a capitalist figurehead, or settler colonial conquest. One that brings both chosen family and friends together to enjoy each other's company, eat good food, play games, and go outside to be in presence of community. One that doesn't require thousands of dollars to celebrate and doesn't produce copious amounts of waste and exploitation, where you can take a break from work and just relax. This is what I would want my December holiday to look like, but I'm just one person. We all need to be developing alternatives to Christmas and the holiday season and be thinking about the question journalist Valerie Penn asks, how do we reinvent this holiday season to have a deeper meaning than what appears to be a celebration honoring the god of capitalism? This is a difficult endeavor, especially because we exist in a global capitalist system that constantly pressures us to consume and work. In order to truly rid ourselves of capitalism's stranglehold on Christmas, we need to dismantle and replace it with a system wherein we all control and own the factories and systems of production. In short, we need to end capitalism as we know it. But that world might be a little ways off in the future. So what could alleviate the pressure to consume and pollute during the holiday season right now? Buying fewer presents or making your own is a start. As we've already discussed, however, this consumer side solution has yet to drastically change the shape of production and the pollution it causes. But changing the way you do gifts might be an accessible first step to changing the way you celebrate the end of December and the new year. Emphasizing interpersonal connection rather than material consumption is just a small way to shift the values of the holiday. But this shifting could also take the form of a communal potluck with friends, neighbors, and extended family. The key is to expand Christmas out of the home and the nuclear family outwards, towards your larger community. While Christmas is rooted in Christianity, its capitalist takeover has secularized it. Reclaiming Christmas, not for Christianity, but for an opportunity to explore what it means to have pleasure outside of capitalism, is essential. So this Christmas, expand the scope of what is possible and remember that traditions can always be changed. Maybe that change looks like a return to the public revelry of the past. A celebration of Christmas that upends the status quo instead of reinforcing it. But after Christmas has come and gone, after you've received the presents that don't fit or you don't want, what do you do? 
Holiday returns are as much of a tradition as Christmas shopping, but when you send those pair of pants back to the store, they don't just magically disappear, they have an impact. Which is why I made a short bonus video on the impact of holiday returns and how we can minimize that waste, and you can watch it right now on Nebula. And alongside that video, you can also watch more than 20 other extended and bonus exclusive OCC videos, as well as my next video on overpopulation a whole month early, all on Nebula. If you don't know by now, a group of educational creators on YouTube teamed up to build a streaming service called Nebula. That's home to tons of ad-free exclusive content, like a bunch of extended videos and interviews from me, as well as original videos from other creators like Second Thought, who is releasing episodes of his Nebula exclusive series on fascism every single month. Nebula allows me and Second Thought to flex our creative muscles without having to worry about ad revenue or the dreaded YouTube algorithm. It's a platform made by creators for creators. Instead of the fluctuations of ad revenue, we get the consistency of your subscription. Signing up for Nebula using the link in the description provides the creative backing and stability for our changing climate that's sometimes hard to find through YouTube. And the best way to get access to Nebula is to sign up with our partner CuriosityStream, the largest source of informative documentaries on the internet. I highly recommend checking out the documentary The Island President, which follows the former president of Maldives on his quest to tackle the rising sea levels drowning his country. And if that's not your speed, there are thousands of other big budget movies on CuriosityStream, like a host of David Attenborough nature documentaries, or even ones imagining what the future will look like. And right now, you can get access to both Nebula and CuriosityStream with our bundle deal available at curiositystream.com OCC for 41% off. That's $11.79 a year or a little under a dollar a month. So under a dollar a month for my next video a month early, exclusive OCC videos, no ads, and the warm feeling knowing you're directly supporting our changing climate. Again, go to curiositystream.com OCC or click the link in the description if you want to sign up for Nebula and CuriosityStream. And if you're looking for a quick way to sign up for Nebula, you can click on the link on the screen right now. And if you're looking for another video to watch, maybe check out my last video on carbon hypocrisy. Otherwise, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next month.